apologies. Apologies have been received from Councillor Howard Sykes with Councillor Angie Clark substituting. Are there any further apologies? I'll take that as a no. The second item of business is to receive nominations for a chair of the committee. Are there any nominations? Move Councillor Aldred. Is that seconded? Seconded. Can all those in favour please unmute your microphones and respond? Agreed. 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 So, Councillor Aldred is appointed chair of the committee. Councillor Aldred, would you like to take the chair? Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for the reappointment. Um, point three, um, appointments of vice chairs. I've had two nominations for this, so I've got Roger Jones and I've got Doreen Dickinson. Is there any other nominations? So I'll take that forward. If everybody's in agreement, can you please acknowledge, please, and let me know. Agreed. 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 OK, thank you very much. Um, so those have been appointed. So membership for the 2021. I'd like to welcome some of the old members back and also take this opportunity to mem to uh, welcome new members. Um, we've got Richard Gold from from Bury. So welcome, Richard. And Thank today you. we've got Councillor Beverly Fletcher, who's a substitute for Bolton Council. Welcome, Beverly. Oh, sure, it's here. Beverly's not oh, here. Oh, sorry. Right. She's okay. She, Beverly is our new deputy from Bolton, though. Right. Give her our best, then, won't you, Stuart? Certainly will. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can we all recommend the membership as put through in the committee minutes? All those yep. agreed? Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Item five, Members Code of Conduct. Gwen, pass over to you. Thank you, Chair. I'm within your papers, Members. It's a short aid memoir of your obligations under the Code of Conduct and the types of interests that you need to register. Um, it's for noting and if Members have any concerns about registering any interests, please, please contact me and I'm happy to assist. OK, thank you very much for that. Anybody get any problems with that? No? OK, thank you. Item six, terms of reference and rules for procedure. Gwen? Thank you, Chair. Um, the papers again set out the terms of reference, the delegations uh, to the committee that have been, been agreed by the CA, the constituent councils and the mayor, and attached also are our rules of procedure for your information. OK, can we all agree those? Yeah, I did indicate okay. I wanted to speak. Oh, sorry, if you just put it up individually, John, on each item when I raise it, if you just click on the speech bubble, which Nicola mentioned earlier, and then just type it in there, then hopefully I'll be able to uh, to see the individual ones. OK, cheers, John. Uh, OK, that's fine. I was just trying to avoid having to repeat it all the time. And first of all, can I apologise in advance? Every time I do these meetings online, I have a dog snoring at my feet. So apologies if that's picked up um, by uh, as well as my voice. Um, I, I just wanted to make two points, really. Um, one was in relation to uh, on page nine uh, to do with monitoring performance. Um, I did raise now, I think this is more than 12 months ago, um, about uh, wanting to see um, how um, change, uh, changes to junctions that um, that we'd pay, that Transport for Greater Manchester had paid for, how successful um, those uh, those changes 
had been and so that we could actually monitor performance of money that the money that had been spent by transport for greater manchester improving junctions we were promised that we would that we would get something back on this but nothing has been forthcoming and it was over 12 months ago that i raised this um, and then the, the second issue was just in relation to if if meetings are going to be held virtually for any length of time, um, I just question whether or not uh, we would be better going back to the old structure of having um, subcommittees where a smaller number of uh, members would be discussing specifically the changes to the bus uh, to, uh, to to buses and uh, and uh, particularly subsidised buses because this kind of environment is not particularly conducive for having a discussion about changes to buses uh, and I think going back to if we are going to be having virtual meetings for any length of time it would be far more sensible to be discussing changes to bus services in a smaller subcommittee. Okay, John, um, I'll ask somebody to come back on the first part. The second part, um, obviously meetings are going to be monthly from now on, um, but we've also, which we're speaking to about after the meeting, about looking at working groups. So it's working groups that are going to be looking at certain things as well as. Um, so on that matter, we've got more meetings in reality than what we had before. So I think we're just going to continue as we are at the moment on that. I don't know who's going to come in on the the first part, what John raised about some road issues. Come on, Mark. You... It's Bob Morris. Uh, Council Leach, I'll take that away and I'll come back to you directly on it, if that's OK. But can we just make sure that you copy me into it as well, Bob, so I know he's been replied because he's saying that he's read this issue over 12 months ago, so just copy me into it. OK, okay. John. thank you. So. Moving on then, can Mark. we agree those terms of reference? Mark, can Sorry? I just interrupt? I can't get, seem to get through on that hand thing, but uh, it's regarding what John said about subcommittees. Just to, to let you know, John, that we discussed in another place earlier this morning about the, 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 the tremendous changes that are going to take place with the bus network and we've agreed to put forward to this meeting we have a separate working group set up purely for the bus issues and i think that's what mark was referring to but it didn't come over very clearly mark i'm sorry apologies for that warren it's because we were going to discuss it later you see so that's why yeah yeah i thought we i'd just pass it over okay everybody okay with the terms of reference then can we move on thank you item seven appoint appointments to outside bodies um here we need five members to the greater manchester transport authority so the labor group would like to nominate myself roger phil and etik again back onto that have we any more nominations i'd like to uh, nominate myself if i can do that chairman because the group didn't discuss it Oh, right. Well, you're fine. You was chair last year, wasn't you, Doreen? So is everybody in agreement of that? Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. And then we need to appoint a member to the Green City Regional Partnership. Now, we nominated Angeliki last year, so can we do that again this year? Everybody in agreement yeah. for that? Agreed. Right. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Item eight, churns announcements and urgent business. Uh, so, should I say we're moving into ordinary business now. So, churns announcements, there are none. So, item nine, declarations of interest. If anybody's got any declarations, can you please acknowledge uh, at any point during the meeting? I know you're supposed to leave the meeting if, if necessary and then join back on afterwards. So, good luck with that if that happens. Um, but the rest of us, uh, please don't forget to send some information to um, Gwen and, uh, and Nicola afterwards on your declarations, okay? So that moves swiftly on 
to item 10, mayoral update. Welcome, Andy. Thanks for persevering with us. No problem. Uh, morning, Jack. Morning. Sorry, Mark, that, I, I missed you then. I'm saying good morning. <laughs> OK. <laughs> do, do you want me to get straight into the update? If you will, please. Well, thanks very much. Um, I think we uh, all will feel it was a, a different world we were in when we met in the Friends meeting house earlier earlier this year, given uh, where we are uh, now. So good to uh, uh, finally see the committee meeting, Mark, and um, uh, good to be able to um, uh, provide an update on everything that's happened. It's been a tough few months for everybody, but certainly on the transport system. I would just want to start by thanking everybody um, out there on the front line on our trams, buses, trains, but also uh, the team at TFGM, people working in all of the operators. It's It's been tough, but everyone's been working together and we've maintained a, uh, a service, let's put it that way, a, a decent service uh, throughout uh, all of this time. Obviously, uh, Mark, um, uh, we're looking at a very changed situation with regard to, to patronage and all the impact that has on finances. So what I thought I would do um, this morning is just perhaps split what I was going to say into two sections. Firstly, the challenge, which is running a transport system alongside COVID, living with COVID, if you like, and that's going to be the reality for, well, it's hard to say, isn't it, until we have a vaccine, but I think we've got to work on the basis it could be as long as a year, uh, and it's a very different year that we will be in, uh, and we have to um, understand all of the issues connected with that, the capacity constraints, but more positively, I think there is then an opportunity coming out of it um, to accelerate uh, reform, to accelerate uh, the green agenda, cycling, walking. So I'll, I'll split my remarks, Mark, into those two um, two themes. So firstly, on the challenge, obviously patronage uh, dropped um, right down uh, on on all modes uh, in uh, the early days of of lockdown, and are still. Uh, very uh, low. I'm sure the committee has been given the figures, but Metrolink got into single figure uh, patronage um, buses a bit higher, but 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 not not much. Um, with um, the um, more recent uh, announcements from the government, obviously we've seen uh, people beginning to return uh, to the um, to the to the system, and I think there has been a, a significant uplift on Metrolink in particular. Uh, over over the last the last week, um, that then presents the the real challenge that we have now of matching available capacity uh, to uh, to demand. Um, and you know I think um, distancing can be maintained on all most services, but but sometimes not all. Uh, in the um, particularly in the morning peak, <clears throat> we took a decision to run a ten minute service mark on on Metrolink with double trams uh, to to make most opportunity available for people so they could distance. Um, I think the feedback from Bob and colleagues at TFGM this week was that some passengers are not doing that. They're not going moving down the tram. So there's there's more work to be done uh, there to encourage distancing on on uh, on Metrolink. And a wider issue for all modes actually is face coverings. I I don't think we're yet where we need to be, if I can put it that way on the wearing of, of face coverings on public transport. If I look at the latest figures, we see a reasonably good level of compliance in the morning uh, peak on Metrolink, sometimes as high as 80%. And let's be honest, there may be reasons why the other 20% um, don't, don't, uh, don't wear, justifiable reasons. So pretty good uh, levels of, of compliance, although it does vary on, on different lines. But that seems to tail off as the day wears on. And um, once the commuter crowd has, has gone, when it's a more general mixed uh, 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 customer base, I think we're seeing levels of compliance uh, fall and it, it's going down to 50% or even less later in the in the day. On buses, I think there's a similar picture, but even, even uh, lower levels of compliance. I think it's more in the 60 to 70 percent range in the morning and, and dropping dropping down. So I think this is an issue that we need to um, uh, devote more attention uh, from a messaging point of view, Mark, and from an enforcement point of view as well. 
Obviously, it's difficult to enforce on buses. Um, it's difficult for drivers to do that. The operators tell me that um, they're encouraging drivers to, to, to ask someone to wear a, a face covering if they board a bus without one. But beyond that, I think it's difficult for them to, um, to, to, to do more. Uh, on Metrolink, we have changed the regulations uh, so that uh, there is a, a potential fine if people are choosing not to wear. And I think you know, we've got to perhaps not stop finding people necessarily, but uh, be, be tougher with enforcement alongside revenue protection on, on the system. So that's certainly something that I, I want to um, give a greater uh, profile to over the next couple of weeks, because it's about giving a message of a safe city, isn't it? I think, you know, if we, if we look at what has happened over the last uh, few days, some people are returning, but by no means everybody. There's still a lot of nervousness, I think, amongst the general public about getting on public transport. Uh, certainly that comes through on the Radio Manchester phone and I do and, and other things. So I think we need to, you know, if we're going to build business confidence, we're going to get people shopping in the city centre, using the bars, the restaurants. I think we have to build that confidence on the public transport system. Um, and uh, I think there's more we need to, to do to do there. Um, Looking at Mark, if I might, just just later on in this year, of course, we need to start encouraging some people back to the city centre um, because obviously the vibrancy of the city centre is crucial uh, to the to the city region uh, as a whole. Um, there are many office based organisations saying that they're not planning uh, to return in any great numbers uh, this year and probably much reduced next year. I do think we need to um, uh, kind of push them to say, look, we need you to bring people back to support the, you know, the sandwich shops, the, the the food outlets, the bars. You know, it's it's important, I think, but recognizing we're not going to be able to bring everybody back, and it's more about developing a plan to bring people back with city centre-based uh, businesses. Um, so I'm looking at a, a return to the city event later this month with Sir Richard Lees and uh, Elise Wilson. Uh, and others to kind of encourage people to return, but working with uh, TFGM colleagues, explaining how we can manage the capacity on the transport system and, you know, encouraging staggered start times to the working day and staggered end times so we can spread capacity uh, throughout the um, throughout the day. We've, we've long had an ambition uh, to uh, rethink the, the, the GM working day and working week. It is very traditional, nine to five, as we know. Uh, and this is an opportunity to 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 do that. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I do think we need to, um, uh, to to plan it linking to what we know as available safe capacity on public transport. Just a word, uh, Mark, on wider uh, confidence. I am, uh, as you might have noticed in discussions with the government around uh, the passing of data, this is not a transport issue, but in the end it, it affects confidence in public transport around uh, cases uh, on the national pillar two testing system and contact tracing system. GM is not currently receiving all of the information that the government has got. Uh, and this was uh, the case in Leicester as well. So we are uh, continuing to make a, a very big argument to the government that we need everything that they know when they know it if we're to kind of be able to build that reassurance to the wider public that we have procedures in place in Greater Manchester to, 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 to chase this virus down in all of our uh, communities. And specifically, we believe we need patient identifiable data, uh, which we're not uh, currently receiving. The colleagues will see in the news that a number of our boroughs are amongst the highest uh, in terms of cases per 100,000 uh, in the Northwest. People shouldn't be too alarmed about that because we're probably the highest because we're the, you know, we've got the greatest population and probably greatest density of population of anywhere in, in, in the northwest. Um, our case, our highest borough is Rochdale. On, on the latest figures, it was high 20s in terms of cases per 100,000. Leicester was 140 uh, last week. So, you know, massive, massive difference. Our cases are falling, not rising. But nevertheless, I hope you'll understand that I need to be very vigilant on that, that point because it would affect public transport, it would affect, you know, a local lockdown would affect everybody. It'd be a really nightmare scenario, I think. And um, I want the committee to know that I'm doing everything within my power to, to prevent that happening. But that requires having the most reliable, up-to-date information. 
a quick word, Mark, on uh, the finances. Uh, we obviously made a big push to the government um, alongside other mayors and other cities to to get um, funding support for uh, for uh, Metrolink. Um, bus has had a package direct from DFT to bus operators. Trains the same. Um, we've had a, a, a patchy and quite partial uh, approach to uh, covering Metrolink costs, although to be fair to the government, the last deal they gave us was was a much better deal. 95 percent pretty much of our costs covered until early August. And, and this is something that I wanted to bring to the committee's attention because we may well need some support uh, from you uh, across uh, the political spectrum. Um, you know, we, we, need, we believe we need to see an extension to that deal, obviously reflecting uh, the slightly improved financial outlook of Metrolink as, as people have started to return to it. But it's crucial to the city region's recovery, I think, that we have a financial platform, a stable platform for Metrolink uh, going beyond this more hand to mouth uh, situation that we've had. So the deal runs out in early August and you know we are going to need to lobby again to get a, 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 a similar deal for Metrolink uh, going uh, forward. Just just lastly, Mark, you know, recognising the, the challenge that we're all living through, we've done what we can to help people. We, we made uh, older people's concessions um, usable before 9.30, particularly when there were, there were pressures on the supermarkets. And that's that's changed now, but we, we did try and help people in that period. We gave NHS and social care staff um, free access to, to Metrolink for a limited period as a gesture of our of our appreciation. And I have recently um, reopened um, applications for the R Pass, uh, which is a two year pilot, as the committee will know at the moment. But you know, young people, I think, have had their lives more derailed than than anybody uh, in this this uh, time that we're living through. I think it's critical that we support our young people uh, coming out of this. Diane Madal is chairing a young person's task force uh, for us. Uh, and you know, as, as part of that focus on young people, we wanted to make an early commitment to those kids waiting for GCSE results, basically those year 11s, that there will be an art pass for them in um, uh, in September, so that they can um, get on with their lives as best as they as best as they can. Uh, we've also though made a decision that the year 13s, who were the first year, or, or, you know, the people who only get art pass for one year and lose lose the eligibility um in the um this uh, sorry next month we've said to them that while the bus travel won't be free for them we are going to uh, open up the opportunity the free opportunity side of our pass to them for an extra year to try and to try and help them uh, out so mark that summarizes the kind of challenge of living with covid on the transport system i'll talk briefly about the uh, the, the opportunity uh before handing back to you the opportunity of course as i said is to accelerate change um we um, are seeing real change in our districts with regard to cycling and walking, both in terms of the numbers of people out there doing both of those things. Um, also, though, the, the use of emergency pop up measures to uh, create space uh, for uh, cyclists and pedestrians, really important. Uh, and I'm really grateful to the to the districts for, for, for supporting this because there are a lot of people without a car in Greater Manchester. Uh, and I've just been describing how public transport is so capacity constrained. So you know, it is really important that we, we give people another alternative, people with no car, struggling to use public transport. This is a big justification for why that we are promoting cycling and walking uh, in this period. As the city begins to return to normal life, I think you know, it's going to become more important that there is, um, that there is space to, to accommodate uh, people who are choosing not to use the car because let's be honest traffic congestion is going to be bad um, for the foreseeable future and people have to have an ability to escape it and um, hence the, the focus on emergency active travel and we've got bids going into the government on behalf of the districts to support that as well as accelerating schemes under the under the B network um, and you know there's been some fantastic uh, developments coming through recently that the, the Manchester Cyclops Junction. I don't know if you've all seen the images of that. Uh, amazing. Uh, this is what we want to see. You know, we're really starting to innovate. It's the first of its kind in the country. Um, you know, we're 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 in a really strong position because of our work on cycling walking to capitalise in this period. And I'm trying to get the Mayor's Challenge Fund out of the door to districts to get that money spent. I'd appreciate if committee members could chase that within districts because you know we need to we need to get that that that. Um, 
uh, high quality provision on the ground as quickly as we can. Just, just to look to the bigger picture though, it is an opportunity here to reform public transport um, towards the London style integrated system that we've spoken of and I spoke to the committee about earlier this year. And I particularly see an opportunity to link that with the clean air agenda. Um, and of course, the, the minimum standards for taxis that we're that we're talking about. What we need to do is start to bring these things uh, together um, and you know work towards a London style zero carbon public transport system in, in Greater Manchester, uh, zero emissions. Um, we're asking the government for funding to support the move to um, zero emissions vehicles, um, taxis, but vans, uh, buses too. Um, and obviously some of that investment might support a reformed public transport uh, system. So I do think this is an unprecedented moment uh, of challenge, Mark, but also of opportunity, um, given that the government is so now heavily subsidising public transport outside of London for the first time ever in our lifetimes. We've never seen this. Only London has ever, ever had this level of public subsidy uh, before. This is uh, a rarity, let's say, to see this level of public subsidy in all modes of public transport in cities outside of London. I think that presents an opportunity to, to rethink things. Uh, it's a window of opportunity. I want Greater Manchester to be at the forefront of, of, of taking that advantage. Um, and um, I'm having constructive discussions with the government um, about how we how we can move these things forward. So, Mark, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll um, I'll hand back to you. And of course, happy to take any questions. Thanks for that, Andy. I've just got three people that's indicated. So, first of all, I would like to bring in Phil. Jason, Mark, morning, Andy. It's morning, just a Phil. quick cu couple of points, please, Andy. You mentioned that you want to enforce. Um, the wearing of mask of Metrolink. How do you expect to do that? Because you'd have to come under one of the bylaws for the railways if you tried to enforce something on the light railway system. Have you considered the health and safety of staff? Uh, are you aware of the policies what Met Metrolink has into maybe removing potential conflict from people on the trams? And also you mentioned the funding. How positive are you in getting the funding? There's a lot of worry considering the recent news article saying that you've only got funding till August. How can you reassure people using the Metrolink that you are fighting hard to get this funding? But it's really the bylaw handy. The, the inspectors do not have any powers at all to remove people from trams or to enforce anything on trams. They can only advise people to wear the masks. And I think we're leaving ourselves wide open if you try to enforce something which isn't enforceable. Thanks, uh, Phil. Shall I answer one by one, Matt? Can't. Just okay. answer this one yes, and I'll sorry. bring in two at a time, Andy. If that's okay. Okay. okay, thanks, Phil, for your question. Now, uh, Phil, I, I, I stand to be corrected by uh, any member of TFGM staff if I've got this wrong, but uh, my uh, information is that the conditions of carriage for Metrolink have been changed. You know, the our own regulations that set out the, the, you know, the conditions for people using Metrolink have been changed to permit a £100 fine if people uh, refuse to wear a face covering um, on being asked. I mean, obviously, that's a sort of a, you know, an extreme measure, if you could put it that way, and much better to ask people to leave or to you know, to kind of persuade them or what, you know, but 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 it is there. And um, I have been talking to uh, Eamon Boylan about uh, a, a higher profile effort to kind of drive up uh, use of face coverings, um, informing the public about that uh, provision. As I say, I don't want to find people, Phil. I mean, I'm not, I, I, nor do I want to put um, staff in a difficult position. I, it would be with GMP, British Transport Police, travel safe officers that we would want to to do this, not just leave it to Metrolink staff um, on the ground, uh, drivers, etc. So, I mean, I, I think it can be combined with revenue protection. I think there, are, there is a revenue protection challenge that has emerged through through the strange period that we've been living through. So I, I think, you know, the time has come for more visibility around, around uh, our messaging, um, the powers that we have. Um, I just think it will, it's, you know, what I hear is it's unfair on other passengers who want to use it, who feel very uncomfortable when there's people on 
the, the carriage is close to them without, you know, and I think, you know, we've got to, we've got to think about it in that, um, in, in that way. And actually probably needs to be more of a societal message anyway. I think, you know, we've all got to get into a more of a discipline of wearing them, I think, um, because this, uh, this virus ain't going anywhere anytime soon. And, um, you know, it, it, if you hear some of the people who've had it, it's, it can be absolutely atrocious and, you know, we need to, we need to uh, respond to that. And I, I just want the, the city region to sort of kind of give off a message of safety because then it's about bringing visitors back. It's about everyone feeling that this is a place that puts safety at the heart of what we do. And I just think it's important, uh, Phil. But I take on board your, your points. Uh, but I, I am thinking more GMP, British Transport Police, uh, rather than, as I say, uh, you know, uh, frontline staff. Um, if, um, if I could just turn to funding. Well, you're right, you know, the funding does run out uh, very soon. When we got the last funding round, I had to challenge the government quite hard about what it would mean if we didn't get the money. Um, we would not. We'd have to mothball the system. And there was a, there were some messages coming out a, a while ago from civil servants that that's what we should do. And obviously we we resisted that. Um, and I also then pointed out that London had had a 1.6 billion pound uh, bailout of their transport system, and we were we were speaking of a, a you know, single figure millions per per month. Um, so then, to be fair, they listened and we got a package and I welcomed the package, um, but it runs out and it runs out, I think, the 3rd of August, I think it runs out. So we're going to have to start again uh, on that lobbying effort. And you know, Mark, I'd appreciate the support of the committee, particularly members of um, Conservative members, Lib Dem members, to show that this is a, you know, a whole city approach to, to calling for this funding. It, this city of ours will, will have a faltering recovery if we've got a reduced public transport service. And I think we need to make that point on a cross-party basis. It's a very good point. We mentioned it previously too. So thanks for that. I've got two, the next two, I've got David and then John. Thank you, Chair. Hi, hi Andy. Um, hi, David. Hi. It's, it's just a, a question on, on uh, walking and cycling. Um, and, and this first um, tranche of money that we've we've obviously got, um, well, the, the combined authority TFGM has got. Have we got any more indication yet in terms of when decisions are going to be made, when you know as to when and where this money is going to be distributed? Because I've got um, people who are champing at the bit really to to get these um, pop up routes potentially on the ground as soon as possible. I'm conscious we've already eaten up a fair bit of time um, to to get these um, pop ups up. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any indication yet as to when um, local authorities will get confirmation as to the amount of funding that they will receive um, against the proposals they've put in um, as part of the tranche one bid. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, just uh, one comment and two questions, please. The comment, uh, very happy to support um, calling on the government to ask for more money, whatever you want us to, uh, whatever you want the Liberal Democrats to do in relation to that, very happy to do. Um, in terms of questions, uh, just um, in relation to face coverings, I'm pleased to hear you say that you want to go, potentially go down the enforcement route. I just wondered whether there'd been a, a, any um, any conversations with people about whether or not that is actually stopping some people from going back onto public transport in terms of not think not wanting to uh, travel simply because they know that other people aren't using face coverings. Um, and then the second question was in relation to cycling. Clearly, that there was an enormous spike in cycling uh, during lockdown, uh, and then that's tailed off a little bit. Has that tailing off continued, or has it stabilised now? Thanks, uh, thanks, David. Thanks, uh, John. Uh, so, David, on your question, I, as I understand it, um, the allocations have just been agreed. Uh, the district allocations. Uh, I think that came through to me late last night as I saw it for the first time. So I would hope that districts are being informed of those uh, allocations t today. Um, could someone confirm that, Bob? Is, have I got that right? Uh, Andy, yeah, we received uh, the further detail from the local authorities on Wednesday evening. We've been going through. There's still an element of over programming. So what we're doing now is categorising them against the DFT requirements to make certain that we can reclaim all the monies on the works. 
and the team are on with that and we hope to get something out as soon as possible. Just a fur further word on it, uh, David, when everyone sees the table, you know, everyone will say, oh, look at this borough's got and this one's not got very much, etc. There is a tranche too. Um, and we will very much want to even things out, you know, in, in that tranche too. I have to say, you know, the government is very keen on this policy of emergency active travel. You know, they are pushing it very, very hard. And you can understand why, I think, for the reasons I, I gave earlier. This committee, uh, if I could say this to you, Chair, maybe has a role to sort of you know, negotiate with districts to get these schemes to sort of match up as best they can so to make it as coherent as possible. Um, because obviously there is another tranche and there's talk of a two billion pound fund for active travel later this year and you know i think there is a sense of you know the, the ones who are kind of the most um uh, enthusiastic are going to benefit the most so you know gm's got an opportunity here but i think we do need to see coherence across the 10 districts in terms of the schemes that we're we're trying to uh, to bring uh, to bring through john uh, just to start by saying thank you for that offer of of support um and i, I will very much want to take take you up on on that on face coverings um it, it's an important consideration isn't it because everyone sort of thinks about um you know the people who might not want to wear one but actually what what is it doing to people who are then put off from using public transport and i think that's such an important point we have had some um surveys done of transport uh, of passenger attitudes i don't know if kate brown's on the call who, who who was close to that work or 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 again bob if you remember there was, there was some research i think done on this wasn't there there was andy and um, i can't remember the exact figure but it was around the 30 odd percent were dissuaded from not using public transport if others didn't wear masks so that's reaching high in our communications that we're putting out to all local communities and then on the, the cycling and walking point, uh, John, um, I think it, it has tailed off uh, a little. But if you look at the figures um, the, 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 the Bob and the team always say to me that it follows the weather quite, quite closely. And it's been pretty grim, hasn't it, for how long now? But it feels like at least two weeks, doesn't it? But 10 days or so. I don't know whether it's going to get any better this weekend, but it really does jump up the minute the weather gets uh, when it gets drier it jumps right up so they're still much uh, higher than they were um the, the uplift was 22 percent i think on um uh, during during lockdown um and it's still higher but it does fluctuate according to to the weather i think it'll also be a good situation to bring in um the working group for a you know for the cycling and walking thing Andy. so yeah, uh, we'll definitely look at that as a committee and then we can report back to you. Thank you. Um, next two people I've got, I've got Nathan and Doreen. OK, is Nathan going first, Chairman? Or? You, Doreen. OK, hi, and good morning. Morning, Doreen. Um, yes, you've certainly got the Conservative support for more, you know, for better, not better, more stability in funding. Thank you for metrolink. Uh, so anything you need is to do, just let me know. Um, Mick, it's not a question really. I'm hoping I've got this right. Um, with the clean air zone, uh, I'm sure that Greater Manchester asked the government for longer a longer period, and they said no. Have I got that right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Was. Okay. So, so my, ne my next point is, I think cross party with coronavirus. You've said yourself this coronavirus isn't going away in the short term, and air pollution has dropped massively. And I think that's a really good platform to lobby government to give more time because they're saying, you know, that they still want us to act. Yes, of course. But if air pollutions are really, really low, it would give us more time to get a, perhaps a better system. Uh, and and more funding that rather than penalise uh, you know small businesses with vans and things. I, I just think we need more time to 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 get it together properly because I don't feel it is. Thanks, Tori. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you for that. On on the face coverings, I had occasion to go on the tram, and I have to say, 
I felt particularly safe on the tram. I had a face covering myself, most people did. And it, it was a pleasant experience. Went from Aldrium to Berry, um, stopping off in the city centre, very comfortable. So we should be encouraging people back on uh, modestly. Um, well, that then couples, we're gonna hit a capacity issue. And my main concern, and I've been speaking to a lot of businesses, both in the city centre in many boroughs, is that the businesses won't make it. And that harks back to your point of trying to get the vibrancy back in the city. And that then links with other businesses. I spoke to many businesses that have said they are not going to return to the office model full stop. They've managed to function perfectly well. So there's a very careful balancing act between the transport, getting people into the city. And then there's been some very ham-fisted um, schemes put out. I've seen very elegant schemes in London on the cycling and walking. The ones we had in Trafford have been particularly poor. I think they were rushed out and not thought through. If we think them through well, and that's perhaps down to TFGM to monitor the, the schemes, um, we can have a good result. But again, we've got to temper that with choking off the cars. Because if we choke off the cars into the city centre, the business is going to struggle even more because people don't feel confident. Very, very fine balancing act. I would like some consideration, perhaps, to two hours free parking. I don't know what, I know some boroughs have brought it in to help these businesses. And if we lose these businesses, our city, cities and town centres are going to be absolutely knackered. Have you, has that been given any thought at TFGM level to balance the public transport with getting people into the towns? Shall I take those two questions, Matt? If you will, please. So, Doreen, thank you for, for what you said around support on funding. I, I really appreciate that. And I think also your support on the clean air zone would be um, would be really helpful. Um, to clarify, we did ask for the government for more time on on vans, particularly because vans um, are a challenge from a small business point of view, but also in terms of the technology around uh, cleaner, cleaner vans. And I think they have now agreed to that again. They didn't originally, but they, they have again. So that that's that's right. definitely something. Um, I, I, I mean, obviously we're all under a legal, all 10 are under a legal instruction. So delaying the clean air zone feels challenging, I think, given where we are. And Client Earth, you know, the organisation that has brought this legal challenge will, if we do try and delay and, you know, it, the districts could face, I think would likely face uh, a legal challenge. I think a better way to go at it is that cross-party appeal on funding. And what I would like to get to a position on is a much clearer, sharper message to businesses, taxi drivers and others to say, we will guarantee you this level of support to change your vehicle. And we're not yet quite in a position to say that because of the, you know, the, the funding's not quite there. What I would like to get to is a kind of a really clear guaranteed offer so that, um, you know, we can support people through the process um, and ensure, hopefully, that they are not left um, too far out of pocket. Because obviously there are savings to be gathered from um, a, 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 an electric or a, or a, a hydrogen vehicle that, that can then be offset from the capital cost of changing. And I think, you know, I've asked TFGM to look at all forms of support, grant, loan, you know, all, all kinds of help. And I just think what we've got to do is kind of lobby the government for more money, definitely, um, but then turn it into a very, very simple public facing support scheme. So everyone absolutely knows where they, where they stand. And we really explain the benefits to people of changing, you know, not just the wider societal benefits, but the benefits to their business because of the running costs of a, of a, of a um, you know, a, a, a zero emissions vehicle. So I, that's the way I think we should, we should go at this. But you're absolutely right to flag the, I've got the same concerns, you know, it's a really tough time for people and to kind of hit them with this, it will feel like, a, oh my goodness, another thing that's, com that's coming on. Uh, are they not living in the real world kind of thing? I, you know, I completely understand what you're, what, what you're saying. Can I come back, Chairman, just for a minute? Certainly. <laughs> yes, Andy, I agree, and it, and it is about helping funding and things, but this coronavirus is going to change a lot of what we do, it, as it has done. So even now you've got H&M closing shops because they know more people have shopped online and people that were nervous of shopping online because of coronavirus have had to do it and they like it now. 
So traffic itself will, I think, that I'm talking, I'm not talking uh, cars, but um, vans, lorries and things, I think that will go down and it will, air pollution will come down automatically with it. I don't mean to the extent that the clean air earth people want it and we would have to do something, but it's going to alter. So my point is whether the plans we've got now are too heavy, shall I say, I, I think it needs looking at. Uh, with the situation of coronavirus. We didn't have it when we did all these plans. OK, thanks, Andy, anyway. Uh, no, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good observation, Doreen. You're, I'd agree with you, the world is going to change, isn't it? Yeah. Not just temporarily, I think it's going to change permanently. And you are right, I think it's the same with any plan we might have in Greater Manchester. You have to look again at it in the light of that yeah. new world that we're in. I don't think, though, that I'm as optimistic as you about the drop in tra road traffic. I, I worry um, for the reason I think Nathan was touching on and, 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 and others have this morning, that road car traffic might increase actually in this in the short term. And then once people are back in their cars, you know, it's can you get them back out again? You know, it's, that, that's a concern. Vans, I think vans could definitely go up rather than down because of what you said about online, online shopping, you know, it's um, a risk, I would say, that we're going to see a lot more vans on the road um, if we see that real shift to, to online. Because, you know, well, I, I, now that I've been working from home, I see how much stuff my daughters are ordering from uh, various <laughs> places, and there are a lot of vans <laughs> pulling up every now and again at my my house. Um, so there are a lot of vans on the road. But I, I agree with you. I think your broader point about looking intelligently again at the plan we have yes in the light of the new world we're in is absolutely the right thing to do of course it is but i i do still think funding should be our big push rather than okay. delay but well you know i'll take on board what you said and obviously we'll speak to the team about it nathan um you're right that phrase you used uh, balancing act is that is the right one isn't it um because what we've got to try and do with constrained capacity everywhere cater for everyone and that's going to be really really tough um and yeah it's going to be make me quite unpopular i guess at times but uh, you know there's just no way about it you know we're going to have a tough time on the transport system it's just it's as simple as that um i i i hear what you say about the free parking um obviously districts would have to take that decision them, themselves um there are free parking at tfgm sites and um you know that that's something that 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 helps but you know I, I i hear what you say i mean obviously we had the decision to withdraw the nhs free parking this week um i i, I think the government should probably have continued that uh, myself because if you're nhs staff i think you've got more reason to use your car than anybody because you know going on public transport picking something up and then going into the ward or the care home um so you know i i think there are free parking for certain groups given their professions i think is something possibly that should be looked at because i think some so, some people have more reason to use a car than others for from an isolation point of uh, point of uh, of view but i i yeah I, I take your point entirely we're going to have to make some really tough decisions um around allocation of capacity uh, over the over the coming period there was free parking in the city center throughout lockdown which i think was appreciated by a lot of people whether there's anything more we can do with the likes of ncp and um, and others to maybe reduce the cost of parking, given that they're not seeing the same amount of customers at the moment. I don't know, but um, you know, I, I, I you know fully appreciate your your your, your thoughts, and was pleased to hear that the, the Metrolink experience that you had was a good one. Andy, I'm actually conscious of the fact that you've got another call to go to. Can you just fit Steve in? We've just got one course. more. Yeah, of course, Brilliant. of course, Steve. Thank you. Uh, right, oh, thank you. Uh, Andy, uh, yeah, just, just a couple quick points. I mean, uh, first on the clean air plan, it's actually been put back one year to 2022 from 2021. So that might help Doreen. So that, uh, that's, I think that's been agreed across most of the districts now. Just come back on uh, public transport, though. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, I, mean, I mean, you're right about what we've seen during lockdown. We've seen all the schools closed uh, or mostly closed. Uh, we've seen uh, parents furloughed beautiful warm weather so it was going to encourage a lot more walking and cycling and uh, I mean I couldn't walk down my own local parks or green spaces because it, it was like people and cyclists were everywhere around there obviously as soon as the weather did turn a bit then obviously that, that did see uh, that that uh, reduction that's uh, actually what I mean I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to go out myself walking when it's pouring down with rain never mind anything else uh, 
But I mean, uh, the concern is obviously post uh, summer. Obviously, once we start getting, uh, obviously, we've already been told that all schools will be open at 100 percent in uh, once we get into September. It's very likely that parents themselves as well will be returning to work. The ones who are still off now will be returning to work. OK, we don't know the extent of it all there, but I think obviously the weather will be turning. It'll be colder, it'll be more rainier and it'll be darker nights. And I think uh, obviously at that point there, uh, I want to get a message out to people to your public transport is going to be safe to use. And I think we used to, I know at the moment we've still got a message saying uh, it's a split message, isn't it? But obviously, I want to see more people using it. I haven't used any myself since because I've mainly been stuck at home. But I think if you don't get the message out, then people will turn to things like cars more, as you've said. And we obviously see we're going to see more vans, that's definite. So I think it's a very careful message at the moment. But we need to say to people, get that strong message out that public transport is safe to use. And I think we need to look at all these messages and comments around this over the next month because. I do fear when we come to that autumn period, uh, then it's going to be a time of change again there. And I think we need to be ready for that. So I think, uh, obviously, I think I don't know what your comments are on that. Please, given the time, I'll, I'll keep it to that. Thank you. No, no, thanks, Stephen. Thanks for coming in and thanks for correcting me on the clean air zone. I, I wasn't aware that I, I forgot that that had been agreed. Actually, I thought it was a, what we were still pushing for. But you're right. It, 2022 is the is the, um, the the start date. And Bob, have I got this right? Have we got 2023 for vans? I think we have, haven't we? 22. We have, yes. Implementation 23 for vans. Yeah. Um, I, absolutely. Um, um, just to go back to Doreen's point, you know, the, the consultation that comes and it is, you know, we're going to agree at the combined authority um, uh, later this month. We move ahead on a, a, an autumn consultation on it. You know, we're going to have to go through all of these issues, the ones that Doreen raises uh, properly as part of that. But yeah. So there is there is obviously a bit more time, isn't there? But as you correctly point out, Steve, I wasn't aware that that had, I, I had forgotten that that had been agreed. Um, so on your broader point, you're absolutely right. Because the message that went out earlier was don't use public transport, wasn't it? That was the government message, actually, you know, drive, you know, and it's like that's great, doesn't it? Everyone thinks, oh, God, you know, that's not the message that we would normally uh, give. So I think you are onto something important when you say public transport is safe to use. But there is a sort of a, a quite just a little kind of qualifications put on that, Steve. I think we can be stronger in that message the more we've got the face coverings issue sorted, going back to the earlier discussion. Because if we haven't got the compliance where it needs to be on that, the public might say, well, hang on a minute, you know, I, I've been, on, do you see what I mean? So the two, the two things need to be sort of um, considered together. What I think we need to, to do is is face up to, a, I think, what is going to be a really challenging situation. But we're going to go into a winter here without a vaccine, um, as far as I can see, um, with a real prospect of, uh, of a second wave. Um, and I think we've kind of been a bit too, I don't think we've been disciplined enough yet in coming out from lockdown. I think it's been a bit, a bit too loose, um, some of the, the messaging. Um, and I'm talking about you know, ourselves, but also nationally. I, I think we're going to have to get as we as more and more people get back to work as the year, year wears on. We're going to have to become more disciplined, I think, in both message and actions to um, to, to maintain high levels of compliance because public transport is safe is linked to how many people are wearing coverings, availability of sanitizer, and all of all of those things. Uh, and I, I think perhaps Steve, my, my best answer to your question is we need a bit of a campaign running through the autumn through the winter on, on on all of that and and yeah i'll be honest with you tougher a tougher approach to the whole thing because it's um it, it's it's going to really kind of worry some people if they if they're forced into public transport where they don't think standards being maintained i think that's going to be a you know going to cause quite a lot of anxiety amongst the public so yes let's let's get to that point where we can say really confident to the gm public public transport is safe but there are certain steps to be done before we can get to that point, I suppose, is what I'm saying. OK, thank you very much for that, Andy. All right. Great. Thanks for joining the meeting. We appreciate it. You're we'll welcome, Mark. To you nice soon. to be with everybody. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, uh, up, come back and give an update uh, as, as frequently as colleagues want. Thank you very much. OK, cheers, cool. everyone. Moving on. Thank you. Moving on, item 11, network report. Bob? Thanks, Chair. I think it's fair to say this report uh, has been covered in the main by the Mayor, most of the items that uh, are in there. We tried to bring what had happened since the last meeting, I start of lockdown, um, right through to today. It's uh, the data that's come out 
um, since the report was published has shown that all of the main modes other than cycling and walking have increased. Uh, highways increased the least um, and cycling and walking over the last seven days has decreased, but mainly driven by the weather. Uh, you know, it's not because of the cycle lanes or anything aren't working. It's just been very, very wet. Um, so on that basis, and I think this probably goes for the second report on recovery, as Andy's covered so much, I'm happy to take questions rather than go through it, if that's OK with you, Chair. OK, thanks for that. I've uh, not got anybody acknowledging that they'd like to ask any questions, so I will move that on. Thank you very much, Bob. Item 12, Transport Supporting Greater Manchester Recovery. We've got Stephen Rhodes for this. Stephen? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you. Morning, really. Much as, as Bob has said there, um, much as much as Bob has said, I guess it relates very much to the mayor's update and the subsequent questions, really, and discussions. That so, I'm keeping it really brief. I think the the key thing to get across is there's you know a very significant amount of work now going on right across TFGM, but importantly with businesses, with operators, other public agencies, very much looking not just at where we're at now and that immediate recovery, but about the medium and indeed the longer run. Uh, recovery and how we get things uh, up and running. Um, obviously, we face a level of uncertainty that's been talked about in some of the questions as to how and when things uh, return. And so we're trying to base that on a, a range of different scenarios that are described in the report and trying to be flexible in how we approach things. Um, I, there is a little bit of a comment there also towards the end of the report about what I suppose you might say is the longer term uh, plans for getting some of our big projects and initiatives back on track and accelerating the work again now. Inevitably, some of those such as the clean air work and transport strategy planning work had to take a bit of a backseat in the very early period after lockdown first happened. Uh, but really what we're trying to do is get across here, Chair, the sort of extent of work really now happening to plan for that, if you like, medium and indeed longer term recovery. And that's very much across the organisation. Happy to leave it at that. Thanks for that, Steve. I've got a couple of people requesting to ask a question. Um, I'll bring in Doreen first and then John. Thanks, Chair. It's, it's not a question. It's just to clarify a point. And I didn't want to keep uh, Andy Burnham, the mayor, here because he's got other things to do. Um, when I said about online shopping, the mayor came back with, yes, but it creates more vans. And it definitely does. But, and this clean air fine whatever you want to call it doesn't affect won't affect cars at the moment to me when you do online shopping that one van is going to 10 houses which is keeping 10 cars off the road that was my point really thank you I acknowledge Dory John Um, it was just really a question in relation to uh, bus reform and whether or not any calculations had been done on the potential increase in cost of uh, bus reform as a result of um, the massive downturn in um, patronage at the moment. OK, thank you. Should I take that, Chair? Um, I think really we, in the report we talk about bus reform as being one of those major initiatives that uh, uh, we, we're really getting back to now and having a further look at that. And there was the report uh, members will be aware of very recently reporting back on the on the consultation. Um, that's very much the sort of work and further analysis looking at the changes and, and issues obviously that the bus market faces very much as we've talked about and the mayor talked about with Metrolink in terms of a uh, needing to have a further look at that uh, over the, the coming weeks and indeed months. So I think it's too early to make any definitive view around that at the present time. And what we're saying there uh, is we're coming back to looking at that in more detail and we'll return to members in due course. OK, now please acknowledge that and make sure that we've, we've got that down so you, you do bring it back. OK, yep. cheers, Stephen. Um, I've nobody else that uh, is interested in asking a question on this, so thank you very much for that. So we'll move swiftly on to item 13, forthcoming changes to the buzz network, part A. 
Have we got Alison or Nick that's taking this? Morning, Chair. It's Nick here. Morning. Morning, everyone. Hope you're all well. Um, usual report, familiar report, though we've got a slight change this time to NXT, which we'll talk about when we come to it. Nicola, I know we've had a few technology challenges. Are you up for sharing the screen so we can maybe point out the report uh, as yes. we go along and look at some of the... Can we do that? We can have a try, Nick. Good stuff. Let's, let's give it a go and see, see what we can do. OK, uh, well, Nicola's doing that. Um, Annex A, which we'll, we'll go through for a busy report um, this this time, as, as is usually the case. Annex A is where we look at the, the commercial changes. So we'll give an opportunity for questions from the operators. A couple of points I'd like to refer to, first of all, a couple of slide changes. Page 67, um, the 42B. Grateful to Space Coach who have agreed to some additional evening journeys. This is the request of uh, local members and residents. So thank you to Adam and the Space Coach team there. And also on page 72, the 336-337, that decision has been deferred. So that reduction in service has been deferred pending further review. So again, thank you to Adam and the team there regarding those particular decisions. Still waiting for the, 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 the shared screen. Is it up there yet? Are we, are we struggling with that? Sorry, Nick. Yeah, we can't get it, I'm afraid. Can't get it? OK, so we're going to have to refer to your individual uh, agendas. Uh, let's open it up then, if I may, Chair. Any questions or comments, particularly for bus op operators on Annex A, please, Chair? Anybody got any comments on Annex A? Chair, I don't know what Annex A is. I can't, I can't seem to find it. But Nick, you mentioned Service 236, I think, on page 72. What, what, I, I didn't quite get what you said it was changing. Right. Uh, 72 is 336, Councillor Bray. Oh. 336, 337. And that Sorry, was... I've got it wrong. On my page 72, it's 236. Uh, okay, that's that's why I wanted to get up on screen so we could all look at the same document. Um, so it relates to a service, I think it was the one in... Uh, yeah, page, th page 73 on my report, though. Okay, it's, uh, it's actually page... Yeah, you're right, page 73. It's the Ashton one. Ashton Hazelhurst. Yeah. Uh, that one's been uh, deferred. That's right, Adam, isn't it? Yeah. So that, that's, yeah, Nick, that, that is correct. That, that's been adjourned, has it? Not... Yeah, we, we've deferred that decision, Councillor Right. Thanks very much. Nick, I think it's one of them that you'll have to bear with members at the moment because we're not seeing much to see okay. whether it's on the next A, B, R, C. I've got okay. a few people who want to ask questions. I'm going to bring David in first. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm, um, it's a bit of a positive stroke negative um, sort of conversation, I guess, now. I'm very pleased with the 42B announcement. Um, uh, credit where it's due there for, for Stagecoach for doing that. I know that there's been a lot of um, demand for that. I know I've, I've crowed on about that a fair bit as well. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased with that announcement. So I'm, I'm very thankful for Stagecoach on that. Um, but I, 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 Nellis, I still do have, I have a couple of concerns, really, with, with what has been proposed. Um, firstly, with the 39310, um, I have had a lot of lobbying um, from, from members and residents to do with that. A petition has been set up by local members in, in the affected ward um, or one of the affected wards, and that's had well over six, probably nearly 700 signatures now um, in Edgling Cheadle Heath. Um, I, I think people are just wondering really, why now? Why now at this time? That's what, what I, I would like to know. Um, as far as I've always been aware, it's been a very, very well used service. In fact, I used to use the service regularly, I used to practice live on it. Um, so um, a, a lot of people are very, very concerned, particularly those, and it does, it did used to, um, well, it, it sort of guess used to, I suppose, in some ways, um, go into my ward. And I've had a lot of representation from residents in my ward 
um, who use that service or certainly their um, um, their teenagers, their um, sixth form, um, you know, kids are going to sixth form, use that service to get to Aquinas College. And now that's going to be far more difficult for them to, to do. Um, so I just want to know really why now on the 39310 um, and, and if there's going to be any other mitigation coming in to, to address the impact that the 39310 cut is going to have. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this is just to do with the X30. Now, at a previous meeting, the X30 was discussed in terms of actually rebranding the service or not necessarily rebranding the service, but giving it a much more higher profile in order to support it. Now, that's obviously now gone by the wayside. Um, it's disappointing because that was a, a, another direct service from Stockport, which went to it went to the airport. I know a lot of um, airport workers do use the X30. Um, so again, that 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 has not gone down well at all. And, and again, I want to know why. And in particular as well, because I believe that um, Manchester Airport Group weren't even told that this was going to be withdrawn um, and they do subsidise the routes or subsidise some of the routes. Now, I could be wrong. That's all I've heard um, from, from a gen at, at MAG. So again, I want clarity on that because if, if MAG weren't told, that is that is very, very disappointing. And that mustn't happen again. Um, because, you know, we, we need the bus network to support uh, Manchester Airport at this time. If it needs us now, it needs us more than ever. And if they're not told that a route that they subsidised was going to be cut, that can't stand. So I want clarity on that, please, as well. Um, that's it, Chair. Thanks very much. I wonder if this, this is stagecoach service, isn't it? So it, it, is, it is, Chair. is an add on there, please, just to, uh, to fill us in on some details there. Cheers, Adam. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, so the 309310, um, basically earlier this year we uh, did a review of a number of services, including the Stockport local network. Uh, following that, you know, we, we came up with a proposal that we put forward to TFGM, uh, which basically reduced some duplicated mileage, uh, simplifies part of the network and introduces a number of new services in areas that we didn't previously serve. Uh, obviously, since then, we've had feedback from yourself and other members with regards to Edgeley. Uh, and the 42 uh, evening trips. So, you know, we have made a number of revisions to those proposals and, you, you know, we've introduced those later journeys. We have also put a proposal forward to reroute the 323, which is a new service from September, and that will cover off the back streets of Edgeley. Uh, the rest of the uh, service, 309 and 310, like I said, you know, there is a lot of duplicated services on there. Uh, I think, you know, from memory, the, the entire route of the 309 and 10 is covered with uh, another stagecoach service. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the X30, uh, obviously, you know, we had discussions with uh, a councillor after a uh, previous meeting. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the numbers on the X30, you know, we were around pre-COVID, we were around 200,000 passengers short of where we needed to be for that service to be sustainable, which is why we were looking at doing promotions, etc., with the service. Now, as things stand at present, you know, uh, there is a 199 service that operates direct uh, the same route from Stockport to Manchester Airport. And there is also the 313 that operates by ourselves from Stockport to Manchester Airport and will now continue beyond to the World Freight Centre. Uh, you know, air, air traffic volume is just, you know, it's fallen off a cliff. We appreciate, you know, the airport hope to get back to something in, in the very near future. And like always, you know, we will keep it under review. Uh, but as it stands, you know, when you're 200,000 passengers short pre-COVID, you know, it's just we we just can't sustain that going forward. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I've got John. John, are you there? John Leach. Yes. Right. I was just trying to get my camera back on. Um, yeah, it, it was just there were just a couple of questions. One was in relation to the um, the changes to the 42B, um, and um, what just a question on what proportion of um, the passengers that were travelling on that are actually are travelling on that or the section that is being reduced. Um, so the section between to Bramall and Woodford, uh, how what proportion of the passengers will only get um, a one an hourly service now? And then my second question was a general question in relation to a number of services being impacted by the closure of Blackfriars Street. And I wondered what consultation there had been with 
uh, operators about the impact that that was going to have on those services and if ultimately the um, the closure of that uh, of that uh, street uh, does lead uh, to sig to have a significantly negative impact on the rerouted services what further discussions will the operators be having uh, with the council about um, about wanting to reopen Blackfriars Street? Pro probably one for the operators. I don't know, Adam, do you have a view on the first question about 42p usage? Yeah, Nick, I haven't currently got the numbers to hand, but I'm you know, happy to come back to Council League separately outside of this meeting, if that's OK, Chair. Yeah, that's fine. Is it Paul Turner would like to make some comment? Paul? Oh, uh, yeah, it's Paul, Paul from Transdorf here. I mean, the answer to Blackfriars Street was very little uh, in consultation. It was quite short notice. Um, unfortunately, we'd already diverted off onto Blackfriars Street from Deansgate, and then Blackfriars Street was turned one way. Um, so now we've we've got a diversion on top of the diversion. We we have been lobbying the city council to change some of the other TROs so at least we could go through King Street instead to get to um, to get to Deansgate. Uh, which would avoid at least in one direction. But at, at the moment, our services, X41, X43, um, have got a kilometre extra on every trip. Uh, now going on a zigzag around Manchester City Centre, uh, customers are no longer able to get to Deansgate. Uh, they're now boarding at Trinity Church on um, on Chapel Street. So um, it, it's, it's really unsatisfactory. Uh, we understand why it was done. It was just a shame. There wasn't it wasn't more coordination at least between Manchester and Salford um because if we'd have known that Salford were planning to do what they were doing on Blackfire Street we wouldn't have diverted there in the first place so the poor customers at the end of the day have had uh, double disruption and uh, that's uh, at the end of the day they're the ones who've been affected by it so uh, we, we hope it's a temporary change uh, we suspect Deansgate will never reopen, but we're, at the moment we're told it's a temporary change and there's consultation ongoing. Uh, but at the moment, it's causing us significant additional expense. Okay, thanks for that, Paul. I'm going to bring Stuart in next. Stuart, thank you. Um, it is about the five seven four. It it is a very. I'd like, like to stress the importance of that service for local people. It, the Martland Hill area and the Devonshire Road area are uh, res residences of a lot of elderly people and the, the Gilner area and the Spa Road area is areas of multi, multiple deprivation and I just want to stress the importance of that. I know the TFGM have put in the report that they are considering uh, alternative uh, action. Uh, can we uh, know that there will be no loss of service in that area if and when Diamond do withdraw the um, the, 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 the service. Thank you. Thanks Councillor Asam. I think what I can commit to is that as, as the report says we are looking at, at, at the options for, for, for reviewing that service and, and I can, can assure you that we'll keep you up to date with that progress uh, as we move forward. So we'll, we'll promise we'll keep you updated on how that progresses. Mm. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for that. I've now got Zibra. Hi. Hello, hi, thank you. Trying to connect as usual. I have a similar concern about 171 and 179 routes, same as Councillor Stewart said. The areas it goes through has high population of older people as well as people who are much poorer. And that is only the route to Biddinshaw Hospital. Otherwise, they will have to, instead of 10 minute journey on the bus, will have to commute to town and back. And because they're much poorer and as well as older people, it is going to cause a great, great issues for them to actually go to the shops or socialising as well as having them hospital journeys. Elena. That's Elena. it, thank you. Okay, Nick, can you come back oh, on that? Can I, can I pick that up in our next seat? Certainly, no problem at all. So I've got one more who wants to ask a question, that's Phil. 
Hi, thanks, Nick. Um, in relation to the X58, the Rochdale service, it's out to tender. Have you managed to find the new tender for that service? Uh, to be honest, I don't know, Councillor Burke. I'll have to check that out for you. Thanks, Nick. Can we get back to Nick straight after that? Yeah, X58, I'll to find out. To Phil, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. OK, nobody wants to ask any more questions, so can we move that? Can we move on to Annex B and C then, Councillor? If that, if that's yeah, right. I oh, Annex C, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to get away with it, back on. I've got a couple of other sections. Um, Annex B, I think if we just pick up, uh, it does refer in there the work we've done on the X30. Um, so just pick it up on Councillor Bella's point. Um, the bit that the airport do fund is that bit to the west side cargo. So therefore, that's where we've extended the, the 313 to one of that for, uh, funding. I will pick up on the point regarding um, were Manchester, were Mag aware of the changes? If there has been some breakdown in communication, I will pick up on that uh, uh, directly with Mag. If I may, Councillor Rule did, I'll move on to my next C. Um, again, a very busy report, I think. This has all been dominated by the fact that we have lost uh, Manchester Community Transport, the decision by them to withdraw from the, the Greater Manchester Market uh, on the 18th of April. Uh, they did a considerable amount of work for us, a, a lot of, of subsidised contracts, and that resulted in the team having to step in at short notice to cover those. Um, so a, a lot of reviewing, we have to consider at short notice of emergency tenders and there's been some long term planning now to consider what to do from the, the 24th of, of July. We'll obviously pick it up in, in part B, but I think just to say that um, the, the financial impact on, on what was the original cost to, to, to what, what the market would have been is, is in the region of 85% cost difference. So that's why we have to post closely review this. That's why there has to be um, some some consideration to 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 the network, and we have considered that in light of, of how much we could consider could cover uh, uh, in terms of patronage, uh, and that's why there's been a real close analysis of this. So really, the changes in this part of the report have been dominated by the fact that we have lost MCT. Um, so we have picked up on, on, on the, the issue that the council raised about the 171 and the 179. I think as the report has shown there, um, the majority of the services have been covered by alternatives. And, I, and these were both services that previously were under strain anyway. So very much what we've tried to do is maintain that level of, of, of viability of these services. So that's why we think the recommendations going forward our best way in terms of the long term viability of these particular services. But going forward, uh, one positive, I think, from this particular section on page 87, um, I think members raised at an earlier committee the loss of the commercial uh, 130, and therefore I'm pleased that as a result of this changing, we have committed to reinstate part of that link, and that il is illustrated by the 42C on page. 87, so I think that's actually some good news for, for members who raised that in the committee. Happy to take any questions, Councillor Alden. Um, Phil wants to ask a question first, but Angie's not being able to attach to this meeting. She's only doing it via text, so can you please answer? I'll get somebody to answer Angie's question as well, please. Uh, but first of all, Phil. Cheers, thanks, Mark. Nick, I'm surprised that I've read the evening news today in relation to the 171 and 179 and the scrapping of the service and that local councillors have been informed um, by the campaigners to save this route. No, no notification has been received by myself or my colleague in Rochdale in relation to this bus route to help with the campaign. These, camp these bus routes play a vital part in their community in getting people around. Please can I have reassurances today from TFGM that they'll work hard in trying to find a solution, the best solution in keeping these bus services running for the local community. OK, thanks for your comment, Casper. Uh, I 
got John Leach again, please. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I, I wanted to raise an issue about the uh, the 179. Um, I have to say, I was, it, the the changes to the the well, the removal of the 179 and the changes to the 171 service and the 217 service. Um, the the report suggests that um, that. Uh, those two services effectively uh, replaced the 179. But the um, I, I saw the article in the evening news where the Burnage councillors uh, were describing it as cuts by stealth. I just wondered what discussions um, Burnage councillors had had with uh, officers at TFGM uh, to, dis uh, to discuss how um, the bits of the uh, the bits of the route that are disappearing altogether could potentially have been incorporated into some changes. Nick? Um, if I'm going to be honest, there's been no direct discussions. This has all been part of the, the bigger planning process through the MCT. So the direct links and the communications have just been gone out through the normal process, whereby once we've released the papers and recommendations, we've then contacted the committee members for the, for the updates and then uh, that's subsequently been fed down so that's just probably the normal the normal process as i said this has been a, a, a an emergency situation that has been done on quite tight deadlines so we've not gone out there and, and done close um engagement with the with the ward councillors i'm afraid Nick, I do appreciate the fact that a lot of officers which we implicated, implemented years ago um, go out and send you information prior. A lot of members, including myself, raise concerns the fact that that's getting narrower. So at one time you were given a good 10 days notice as soon as we got the information to send out to uh, councillors in that area, which I know you have done, but like Getting an email Monday when the meeting's on Friday and then we've got to share it amongst other councillors in our own areas is getting a, a shorter time scale and we would fully appreciate it if you could make sure that goes back longer afterwards, back up to the 10 days if possible. Um, make your job easier as well if you're replying rather than replying last minute. Obviously, um, you're explaining your explanations on why you put this forward to the uh, to the meeting. Um, to members from all around the conurbation a lot sooner. So, so what I'll commit to then, Chair, is, is, is a more formal timeline that we can commit to, to get communication out around, around the formal governance timeline. Great, thank you. Um, I've got David wants to ask a question. Uh, thanks, Chair. It's just on the 307-308. Um, obviously, it is disappointing that, that this is going to be cut, um, but you know, it does run through my ward, it runs through in, in, into Bramall as well. It is taking um, people to Stepping Hill uh, Hospital. There are parking issues around Stepping Hill Hospital that are quite well documented and, and, and um, do attract a lot of attention. Um, I do appreciate, though, that, that TFGM only has a limited pot. Um, I think I did manage to get some figures for the 307, 308. I think on average um, throughout the last year, I think if you take it over a whole year, 365 days in a year, um, it was averaging 185 passengers a day. So I, I, I do understand that, that, you know, in terms of viability, it is, it is tricky. And I guess to, to get a tender um, in, in to run this service would have been quite expensive. However, um, can I try and get assurances from, from, from TF Jim and from, from yourselves um, that, that we can look at whether we can use a current route um, to incorporate the loss of the 307, 308, um, particularly because it, 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 it was, you know, particularly for, the, for elderly people who need to get to Stepping Hill, it was a lifeline and it certainly, you know, it covered a fair, a fair um, part, certainly of Cheadle constituency, which did come into my ward. Um, it did go in, in, into, I think, Cheadle himself and into Bramall as well. Um, so I would appreciate whether we, we can just keep this on the table just to see whether we can we can look at incorporating what's been lost into another route or going forward if, if we can look at um, a more viable um, subsidised route going forward. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Mella. Always, always happy to review. I, I mean, I would just make reference to, to the text on page uh, 108 of the report. That there are quite a lot of significant alternatives on this route for, for, for passengers to use. And that's kind of the, the approach that we took to, to when we will remove routes. That we, we do always consider that if there are viable alternatives for passengers, that's what we will look at. But always we'll work with you, Councillor Mella, to, to keep this one on the table. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, that's the, that's it. Right, moving on to item 14, exclusions of the press and public. Can we move that please? <laughs> 